Welcome, welcome to the Beatle Lectures uh, series. And today, we're, we are honored to have Dr. Uh, Wilcox to come here to give us uh, a lecture. And Dr. Uh, Pamela Wilcox is professor of criminal justice at Cincinnati. And she received her PhD from Duke University in 1994. Since then, she has published over 70 refereed journal articles and written three books plus a few edited books. Her area of research include criminological theories, community dynamics, and violence in school. Her topic today is the presentation in Communities and Crime, an Enduring American Challenge. This is a very important topic of research and can include almost all criminological theories. From the early days of Chicago School, Robert Park's study on social ecology, Frederick Thrasher's research on gang, Sean McKay's uh, investigation of criminal delinquency and social disorganization, followed by Cohen, Anderson, Sampson. Community dynamics has been the center of focus. When I visit my hometown, Shanghai, China, many friends ask me, is American community full of crime incidents? Based on the news media, it is true. I always tell them that it depends on the type of neighborhood. I was in the gym working out last Wednesday, two days ago, and chatting with a deputy assigned to the Woodlands area. He told me that in that very afternoon, there were only two 911 calls in a city of 100,000 population, and 20 officers were on duty. On the other side, if you go to socially disadvantaged neighborhoods like Houston or Dallas, the situation would be totally different. For example, in Dallas, a travel to some areas, two police officers are required to answer a call, if not four. The key point here is there's a significant difference between the communities in the United States. And that variation is the cornerstone of statistics. When we analyze everything, we look at the variance, right? This is why when I'm reading Dr. Wilcox's impressive publication record, I found a lot of your articles are published in Journal of Quantitative Criminology. Because of variation in that area, she's able to publish so many quantitative studies. Unfortunately, in my area of research in policing, there's little variation. Most of the news regarding American police is negative. So there's not much variation on one side. I, always, I would conclude with this. Well, I always like this sentence. Collectively, we know a lot about community today. But individually, we know very little. So the Samson study on community neighborhood with five items to measure collective efficacy is enough? Or Anderson's uh, subculture violence use six items will be good enough? We don't know. So today, we will share the individual wisdom of Dr. Wilcox. Welcome, the floor is yours. Am I on? <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you for the warm welcome and for being here. And thank you, Solomon, for those nice introductory remarks. I think they hit perfectly on the theme of my talk today, that, that neighborhood variation in crime. So first, I just want to start by thanking the committee for this wonderful invitation. It was quite flattering uh, to get the invitation initially. And then when I 
got online and started doing some investigation into exactly what I had signed up for. <laughs> I got downright humbled at that point. What an impressive lecture series. Um, you've just invited some terrific scholars over the years, and I'm in some great company, and like I said, I'm, I'm humbled to be so. Um, the people who have preceded me in this lecture have set quite a high bar in terms of their career accomplishments, and it's a bar I'm not sure I can achieve, but I'm gonna keep trying, and <laughs> in the meantime, thank you. I'm happy to follow in their footsteps and provide this fall's lecture. Um, so today's talk, as the slide suggests, is Communities in Crime and Enduring American Challenge, and the topic and the title of the talk uh, draw directly from a forthcoming book that I have, um, that I've collaborated on with two of my fantastic colleagues at University of Cincinnati, Frank Cullen and Ben Feldmeyer. So I have to give them a shout out right out of the gate because they've been terrific um, colleagues and collaborators in this regard. But just to... Um, give you a little sense of why I, I chose this topic. One, it is a forthcoming book, so it's been something that has, um, it's, it's been a project that has absorbed much of my scholarly energy over the past few years. Um, and when I say forthcoming, I literally mean like in the next week or two, it will be showing up at my doorstep. So I, I turned in the final set of corrections to the final set of page proofs um, two weeks ago, and so it, it's due to be out early November. Um, so in that regard, it, it's just very recent. It is something that I've been working on, and typically when you go to talks like this, people want to know what you've been working on lately, and, and this is it. So in that regard, it seemed to fit the bill. Um, but secondly, it was a book where the target audience, I think, um, for us really was graduate students or for those new to the area of communities in crime, um, kind of getting started in that area without a, a ton of, of experience. And so typically, again, these, these lecture series, I think, are, are targeted towards the graduate student audience, and so I thought it would be fitting in that sense as, as well. And, and thirdly, it's um, a theme that has really um, been something I've engaged with throughout my career, this notion of contextual effects, whether they be school effects, as Solomon alluded to, or community effects. I really began um, pursuing this interest in contextual effects of crime, so above and beyond individual variation in offending, but why social contexts have different rates of crime and these patterns across aggregate units of analysis as opposed to individual units of analysis. I really be began interest in that back in the early 90s when I was a, a doctoral student at Duke University. And, at Duke, I, I studied um, in the Department of Sociology under the mentorship of Ken Land. And Ken is famous for a lot of things. Um, well, first, he's a native Texan, so <laughs> number one. Um, but he's famous for a lot of scholarly things as well uh, and across a variety of fields, including criminology, demography, and sociology. And in criminology, one of the things that he's most noted for is his research on macro level influences on crime. So studying macro patterns of crime, um, looking at patterns of crime across different contextual units like communities, like cities, like counties, like states, and trying to understand that, like I said, aggregate or contextual variation. Um, so working with Ken at Duke really instilled in me a great appreciation for social context and, and seeing patterns, again, like I said, above and beyond the individual differences in offending that are quite important to study, um, but is you know, not the entire story behind crime. So just in terms of thinking about community variation in crime, I think the simplest place to start is to look at a map. Um, look at a map of almost any city in the United States. Um, and I have a map up there of my current home city, Cincinnati. Um, and the shapes on the map correspond with different neighborhoods in Cincinnati. Uh, and so you can see, and the different neighborhoods are shaded from the darkest shading representing the highest rates of crime to the most lightly shaded areas representing um, the, the lowest rates of crime. And so, you know, it takes about two seconds looking at a map like this to see that, that crime is not evenly distributed across neighborhoods in any particular urban area. Um, there is variation, and, and we've known this for a long time in American criminology going all the way back to, well, a century ago to the early 
work by um, the Chicago School criminologists in <clears throat> mapping crime like this in, in the city of Chicago in the early 1900s, and I'll share some of those maps with you in a few minutes too, but um, we'll focus on Cincinnati here for a few minutes. But we've known this, this is a long-standing pattern in criminology, that crime is not evenly distributed across neighborhoods in a city, um, and it's really essentially a, a criminological fact. So why are some na neighborhoods, um, why do they have so much higher rates of crime than others? Well, really the story that I'm here to tell today is that the answer to that question has varied over time. So the answer that criminologists have put forth, American criminologists in particular, have put forth, uh, or st criminologists studying in the United States context, the answer that they have put forth has varied over time, and I think it's varied importantly as a function of the social context, the social historical context in which they were studying. Um, and you know, well, why is that the case? Well, when criminologists provide answers to patterns such as this, what do they do? They look to the world around them. So criminologists studying community variation in crime look to the communities of their time to try and understand, you know, what are the images that I see in high crime communities versus low crime communities? And those images that they see when they peer into the high crime communities of their time then serve to, you know, inform the explanation that they put forward. <clears throat> So the bottom line is that the images that criminologists see when studying crime patterns, again, are uniquely tied to the socio-historical context in which they're actually studying the communities. In that sense, you know, I think the, the moral of today's story is maybe we shouldn't use theoretical ideas that were informed by what high crime communities looked like in the early 1900s. Maybe we should be you know, using theoretical ideas that emerged from what communities look like today, high crime communities versus low crime communities. And that image of high and low crime communities has changed over time because cities have changed over time. So that's really the purpose of the book. And there's the <coughs> cover of the book that's, that's coming out. Did I mention just in a few weeks? So. <laughs> um, um, is we really provide an overview of the various images that criminologists studying American cities and American communities within those cities have seen in high versus low crime communities over the course of the past century. So we start with the early Chicago school work um, in the early part of the 20th century and then go to the current day. <clears throat> in, in the course of, of that um, journey. We cover seven distinct images that, again, have informed um, theoretical explanations for why we, some neighborhoods have higher rates of crime than others. And we link these seven images to three unique historical periods that we see in the United States over the past century. In the process of telling this story and linking these seven images to these three unique historical periods, we kind of provide a portrait of the unfolding or evolution of community criminology. Um, now, that takes up the bulk of the book, that task, but near the end of the book, we then speculate about potential future images of, of communities, what communities of today and tomorrow look like, and so try to, to get our, put our best guess forward in terms of what are the sorts of, of ideas that might inform tomorrow's community criminology. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the book, we, we focus on what we see as seven distinct images that American criminologists have put forth over the past century to account for non-random patterns of, of crime um, across neighborhoods in um, the United States and beginning, they tend to be largely chronologically ordered, but not completely, and I'll explain that a bit in a minute. But beginning with the social disorganization perspective, this image that high crime communities are socially disorganized. Um, and then this idea that high crime communities have a, a weakened system of networks of control. So community as a system was another alternative image. Um, it's a, idea that communities, high crime communities, are truly disadvantaged, that high crime communities have a criminal culture, that high crime communities <clears throat> are a broken window 
that high crime communities provide criminal opportunity and that high crime communities have low collective efficacy or low crime communities have collective efficacy. And we link those seven images which then, like I said, really inform explanations for neighborhood level patterns of crime to three unique historical periods over the past century in the United States. We define these eras as first, the growth of the city, second, the decline of the city, and the third era, the resurgence of the city. Now the decline, or I'm sorry, the growth of the city is the period roughly marking, well, it's the early 1900s, so around 1900, all the way up into the 1960s. This is when American cities were growing, thus the name, the growth of the city. Um, and the one image that we see very clearly tied to that particular socio-historical era is this image of high crime communities as socially disorganized. <clears throat> the second major era is the decline of the city, and this started roughly the mid 1960s and runs through the 1990s. And as the name of the era suggests, we see this is where many American cities were in decline. Um, so instead of growing, there was a very different urban dynamic during this era within the United States. And there were, were a lot of competing images of community that again informed um, <clears throat> why some communities have higher rates of crime than others within that era. So five of the seven images that we have seen um, within community criminology over the past century actually fit into that particular era. Community as a system, community as truly disadvantaged, community as a criminal culture, community as criminal opportunity. <clears throat> And then finally, the third era, the resurgence of the city, um, is really, um, you know, began at the dawn of the new millennium up to the present day. And the, the image of community that is predominant there is community as collective efficacy. <clears throat> so that's really how we've structured the book and our thinking about the evolution of community criminology. <clears throat> now that's a lot to cover in one lecture, so I've pared that down quite a bit. And today's focus is going to be on three of those seven images, one for each of the unique socio-historical periods that I've identified. So I'll talk briefly about this image of community as socially disorganized, which was associated with the era, the growth of the city. Then I will talk about the image community as truly a disadvantaged, which was associated with the era, the decline of the city. And then I will talk about community as collective efficacy, um, which defines or is linked to the era, the resurgence of the city. And then after that, I will provide an overview of some of those future images that I also mentioned, what we, where we see community um, criminology potentially going based on emerging images of high and low crime communities today. So, Image number one, sort of where we started in terms of American criminology and trying to answer this question, why do some neighborhoods have higher rates of crime than others? Um, this image community, the, the answer to that question is, well, high crime communities are socially disorganized. And that answer, you know, that, that answer to the question was um, put forth in the era, the growth of the city. And it is, of course, many of you know this, um, it originated in the Chicago School of Criminology, which refers to this group of scholars studying in the University of Chicago's Department of Sociology at the early part of the 20th century. So folks like Ernest, uh, Ernest Burgess and Robert Park, and Robert Park's pictured up there on top, Clifford Shaw, who's also pictured there, so Sean McKay, um, so, you know, even people who have zero interest in understanding community dynamics and crime tend to have heard those names, you know, Park and Burgess and Sean McKay, like every intro criminology student um, hears about these, which is kind of funny because one of the points of our book is maybe they shouldn't. Maybe we shouldn't be teaching our intro criminology students um, theories of crime that originated in an era that looks completely different than the era that we're living in today with communities that look completely different than um, communities of today. <clears throat> but nonetheless, this is where we started. And the Chicago School Scholars we're using Chicago as their laboratory for understanding, you know, why some communities had much higher rates of crime than others. <clears throat> so what was the, the context of Chicago at the time that they were peering into those communities trying to understand variation? 
Well, this slide gives some, some data to, <clears throat> or provides some data to indicate that what they were observing was, you know, massive social change, growth, 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 thus why we named the era the growth of the city. Um, just to give you an idea of what they were experiencing, you know, Chicago in 1840 was a little town, you know, about 4,500 residents, but by 1890, and keep in mind the Chicago School, which sort of came out of the Department of Sociology, which was founded in 1892 at University of Chicago. So by 1890, that little town of 4,500 had grown to a city of more than a million. And by 1930, when Shaw and McKay were kind of in their heyday as far as collecting data, it had tripled again, more than tripled again, to more than 3.3 million people. <clears throat> What was fueling all of this tremendous growth at the time, of course, was industrialization. Um, there were many you know, industrial jobs opening up in cities like Chicago, um, and <clears throat> that then coincided with um, a lot of immigration. So we had waves of immigrants coming over from Europe, largely white ethnic um, European immigrant groups coming over to cities like Chicago for these good industrial jobs, you know, leaving behind um, a lot of hardship in Europe and hoping to find the American dream, right, in cities like Chicago with all this industrial growth. <clears throat> and just to give a sense of what a, uh, what a major role immigration played in the growth of Chicago, in 1900, um, literally half of the residents in Chicago were not native-born Americans. So this was a really unique historical era you know, in the United States and one that cannot be separated from the ideas then that Sean McKay and Park and Burgess would go on to generate about trying to understand community level variation. <clears throat> so in terms of trying to understand that variation, of course, University of Chicago scholarship was also noted for being um, one of the first in criminology, in American criminology, to focus on empiricism. So really trying to empirically understand these patterns with data and with science. And they used a variety of methodologies, but the one I think that is most relevant for today's talk is their use of mapping. So I'll just stick to that. Um, but the Chicago scholars would pore over government documents to identify where juvenile delinquents lived, and they literally plotted the homes of juvenile delinquents on these pin maps, and one of those is pictured there. The black and white one is actually a, um, a, a copy of a pin map, um, so the resolution there is not very good, but <clears throat> I think you get the idea where those darker segments of the map would really re are really representing pins, and so where it's darker on the map, there's a much higher concentration of pins. Uh, meaning a much higher concentration of homes of juvenile delinquents in Chicago. And <clears throat> when they, in, in fact, um, converted those pins to, to rates of delinquency per, say, 100 youths in particular areas of the city, they found a very clear pattern that the highest rates of delinquency tended to cluster near the center part of the city, just outside um, the central business district, if you will, in Chicago, which sat right along, I guess, I'll orient you. So this is Lake Michigan, so this would be the center of town, and that area where it's really clustered dark right around there um, is <clears throat> this area where you had the heavy concentration. Chicago School scholars referred to this area right outside the center of the city where there was this high clustering as the zone in transition because it literally was a transitional zone between the industrial zone of the central business district and then the more residential zones of the city that sat farther away where you had working class neighborhoods, middle class neighborhoods, what have you. Um, but this zone was unique in that it was in between. It really represented <clears throat> this mix of industry that was bleeding um, from the central business district as it expanded and rundown housing. Um, the housing that was there was not going to be well maintained. People who owned it knew that they could probably, as the central business district continued to expand, sell it for a lot of money, so it ended up being um, not well maintained. And <clears throat> it was very dilapidated, rundown housing. It was cheap housing relative to the more stable residential areas farther away from the center of the city, and it was close to good industrial jobs. 
So it did have that going for it. And for that reason, it was really, this zone was really a, a, a neighborhood or it consisted of a series of neighborhoods that were neighborhoods of first settlement for those immigrant groups that I had described earlier that were coming over to Chicago in waves for those good industrial jobs that marked the era of the growth of the city. <clears throat> And the good news is the immigrant groups would initially have to settle in these, these pretty undesirable neighborhoods. I mean, they were um, you know, smelly and, and, and polluted and, and noisy because of that mix of industry and rundown housing. They didn't have to stay there very long because most of these groups assimilated rather quickly and were able to stabilize and sort of move on to the more um, purely residential, working, and middle-class neighborhoods of the city. But the zone in transition didn't sit vacant. They would, the, the, the space that, that that group had left would just, <clears throat> they would be taken over and they would be replaced by another wave of, of immigrants coming over from Europe. So we had these successive waves of a very heterogeneous mix of, of immigrants coming over. And again, at that time, it was largely European um, immigrants coming <clears throat> to the cities like Chicago. And the interesting thing that Sean McKay noticed is you, know, you had this cycling in and out of groups that would come in, Zone and transition would be the neighborhoods of first settlement, but they would stabilize, make it out, and the crime did not follow those groups. Rather, crime stayed year in and year out, decade and decade out, highest in that zone and transition, despite the fact that the actual individual characteristics of the residents residing in that zone was changing, you know, constantly changing because of this cycle of a heterogeneous mix of immigrants. They were different composition of people each, with each wave, and yet um, it was zone two that had the highest rate. So this led to the very profound conclusion on the part of the Chicago School scholars is that this can't be about individual differences. It's not you know, individual characteristics of residents that seem to matter. It's something about the place, regardless of the characteristics of the residents. Zone two always has the highest rates of crime, and it doesn't follow groups as they sort of make it out of that zone. <clears throat> The other thing the Chicago School scholars noticed then, well, you know, what, what is it then about Zone 2 that may um, fuel these higher rates of crime that we see year in and year out? Um, again, for year after year and decade after decade, they saw three major, I guess, constants really with the zone in transition. They always had high rates of poverty. Um, they always had this heterogeneous mix of people and they always had a lot of residential mobility. Again, people coming in, immigrant waves coming in, wanting to get out as soon as they can, so you had this constant in-migration, out um, movement of people. <clears throat> they put those things together and, of course, come up with the conclusion that high crime communities are socially disorganized. They lack the ability to collectively articulate and uphold shared conventional norms, Bottom line, they lack the ability to adequately control and socialize youths because there are no strong and lasting ties between neighbors in these communities. And that's one of the, you know, the features of social disorganization. Um, people, uh, the, the ethnic heterogeneity doesn't allow that because at that time, literally, you had this group not necessarily speaking the same language. They were moving in and out very quickly, so there was transience. That makes it hard to really develop ties to your neighbors where you can create this social organization as opposed to disorganization. And of course, when they're coming to the United States for the first time, they're not well off financially or economically. And so all of those you know, neighborhood level characteristics really combine to um, you know, fuel disorganization. But the whole process, very importantly, is being fueled by the characteristics of this unique historical era in the United States, that urbanization, that immigration, the industrialization. Um, you know, that was the, the characteristics of the broader socio-historical context that are creating neighborhoods with these structural characteristics of high poverty, high heterogeneity, high mobility, which in turn is creating disorganization, in turn creating crime. Of course, people's images, different criminologists' images of what creates high versus low crime communities also 
um, affects what we do about it. And, and I think the implications for crime reduction from a social disorganization perspective are kind of interestingly somewhat implicitly optimistic. I mean, there was nothing in, inherent in Sean McKay's perspective that suggested that disorganization was going to be a permanent state. Instead, they seem to suggest that most groups that would settle in zone two, it was just going to be a temporary, almost rite of passage that you, you had to endure until you stabilized, made it out to the more prosperous residential areas in the city. Um, <clears throat> so, you know, it, 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 they don't talk about that very much, or that doesn't get talked about very much, but I do think there is some implicit optimism that they suggest there. And it is an optimism, again, that is, I think, uniquely tied to the socio-historical context in which they were operating. There was this influx and in, you know, in out-migration of all of these groups of people, and most of them were cycling through. <clears throat> But in the meantime, they just didn't sit back and say, okay, we do nothing. People will kind of make it through on their own. We don't have to worry about it. This is just temporary. Um, we refer to it in the book as the transitional urban purgatory. <laughs> so, you know, but they didn't sit back and say, okay, the no, no need to worry about it. In the meantime, while people are transitioning through this urban purgatory, um, let's try and, you know, make their lives a little more bearable. And so there were reforms like settlement houses that were geared towards resources to immigrant groups in particular, um, the Chicago area project, which was this massive con um, conglomeration of a variety of, of programs uh, and resources spearheaded by um, Clifford Shaw, um, is particularly aimed at pro-social development of youth in the community <clears throat> and the re reintegration of juvenile delinquents. Okay, but that era doesn't, you know, didn't last forever, right? So um, that era of growth in the United States eventually gave way, th gave way to a very different era in the United States, um, the, the era of the decline of the cities. So cities, you know, around mid-century stopped growing, and many of them um, became um, well, very unpleasant places. So the second image I'm going to talk about, and that is the community as truly disadvantaged, emerges from that second era, the decline of the city. <clears throat> this was an image that was started uh, around the mid-1970s and really continued until around 2000, even into the current day, I would argue. Um, but here, in, in the uh, image of community as truly disadvantaged, ongoing social change that had really <clears throat> spurred this notion of um, high crime communities as being socially disorganized was no longer um, relevant. Um, there was no longer ongoing social change in, uh, in American cities like there was in the early part of the 20th century. So social disorganization had to give way as a key construct for understanding high crime versus low crime communities to something else that seemed more relevant to the time. And one of those, I think, constructs that, that helped us understand in this new era is the truly disadvantaged. This particular image draws heavily from the work of William Julius Wilson, who's, who's pictured there. Um, he's a public policy slash sociologist. And <clears throat> the interesting thing is he um, developed a lot of these ideas in his famous 1987 book, The Truly Disadvantaged. Um, while on faculty at University of Chicago and looking into some of the exact same neighborhoods that Sean McKay had looked into in the beginning of the 20th century. But he saw a very different image in those neighborhoods than Sean McKay had seen. So what did he see? What was sort of the post-immigration United States urban context? Well, the central cities were no longer hubs of manufacturing like they had been in the early part of the 20th century. There was urban stasis, if not urban decline, in many of these areas that had been thriving in the early part of the 20th century due to industrialization. Immigration, heterogeneity, and mobility that had been so key to Sean McKay and other early uh, Chicago School theorists' explanation, that image that they saw in communities, no longer was accurate. It just wasn't existing. 
The inner cities were no longer this cycle of a heterogeneous mix of white ethnic groups. Wilson said, instead, what we're seeing is African American groups being there and being stuck, what he termed being um, a much more permanent state rather than being this transitional urban purgatory that, that the early white ethnic immigrants may have experienced. This was permanent. Um, and it seemed to be the African American groups were stuck in the inner city, so there was decreased mobility, increasingly homogeneous, with African Americans predominating, and crime on the rise. Crime was skyrocketing during this era, too. Just to give you um, a couple of examples, the homicide rate went from five per 100,000 in 1960 to 10. Um, per 100, so doubled in this two-decade era. And if you look at the 20 or the largest cities, that rate went all the way up to 20 per 100,000. So cities like Chicago. <clears throat> Other violent crimes besides homicide tripled in that era. Um, and there was clear indications that <clears throat> um, crime and criminal justice was becoming increasing, increasingly racialized with black arrest rates for violent crime three to four times higher than national rates during this era. So we were having a problem in our cities, but it was a very different problem than the problems that Sean McKay had seen in the early part of the 20th century, and we needed to adapt our understanding, therefore. <clears throat> so how can we explain these high rates of, high rates of crime in that sort of socio-historical context um, and again, William Julius Wilson's organizing construct for doing so was the truly disadvantaged. And it's really an image or a perspective of high crime communities that draws on three different aspects. One, racial inequality. Two, structural problems that hit these, these cities particularly difficult and structural problems in a couple of different ways. One, massive economic restructuring on a, on a national scale, but then that had residual structural, or introduced residual structural problems for inner city communities in particular. And then three, um, a weakened culture that, that came from um, these other two as well. And his idea of the truly disadvantaged kind of brings all three of these together. So first, the racial inequality part of, of, I think, Wilson's notion of the truly disadvantaged. You know, the, in the earlier era, um, all of the, the groups coming into the inner city for these industrial jobs were in pursuit of the American dream. And those white ethnic groups that <clears throat> characterized the immigration in the early part of the 20th century, by and large, were able to achieve that. They came in, you know, settled in zone two, but again, like I've said several times, made it out relatively seamlessly. Well, the last line in uh, the, you know, these different waves of groups coming to the cities were African Americans migrating from the south, southern parts of the United States, to cities like Chicago for the same reason, for those industrial jobs that all the white ethnic European immigrant groups had come um, in search of. <clears throat> but they did not assimilate nearly as seamlessly. And part of it was just uh, racial segregation in terms of housing. They didn't have the same options as the white European ethnic groups. But another big problem occurred is right about the time that you had these waves of African Americans from the South moving to the cities, our US economy uh, changed, like I said, quite dramatically, deindustrialization. Um, came into play. And so all of those factory jobs that fueled, you know, the industry that were part of the industrialization and the growth of the city, many of them fell upon hard times and went away. And so the inner city and the sort of the employment um, options in the inner city changed. It looked very, very different than, again, what Sean McKay had seen in the early part of the 20th century. Um, <clears throat> And that deindustrialization was, you know, the, the importance of it can't be overstated from Wilson's perspective in terms of then the implications, the ripple effects that were seen in inner city communities. With the jobs that were once plentiful for um, groups with somewhat lower education but in need of a living wage were gone. The manufacturing sector had supplied that kind of job. 
those jobs, when they went away, were not replaced with jobs that had similar education requirements and a similar um, pay scale. Instead, they were replaced. The jobs that required the same level of education as the manufacturing jobs were replaced with service economy jobs um, that were minimum wage and that where you could not support a family. So um, this process led to a lot of problems for the inner city communities. Deindustrialization led to massive and chronic unemployment, particularly again among inner city black men because that's who was there at that time, at that historical moment. Um, that then fueled massive changes to family structures, in particular in black families. And Wilson talks a lot about you know, the, sort of the economic incentives for marriage just simply weren't there with so much male unemployment. And so you had soaring female-headed family, rates of female-headed families, particularly, again, among African-American families. And then finally, um, with things getting so sort of desperate in the inner cities, um, there was a, a mass exodus of middle class black families from the inner city. And Wilson refers to this, you know, leaving um, the residents behind without what he refers to as social buffers. Um, you know, uh, uh, middle class families that could buffer the experience of, of poverty. Um, so when you think about it, if you're an impoverished family, um, but you're living around a, a bunch of other families that are not living in poverty, that's a very different experience than if you're an impoverished family and you're surrounded by many other impoverished families. If you're an impoverished family and you're surrounded by non-poverty, that buffers you know, that experience. Those non-poverty families can provide resources, support you know, for you, and, and, and improve that experience. Um, but when there's a predominance you know, of poverty in an area, you've lost those social, social buffers which can alleviate some of the pains of an impoverished experience. And that's what he refers to as concentrated poverty when it just it got to the point with the middle class uh, leaving the inner city, there was just this concentration of poverty like we had never seen before. <clears throat> I've included a couple of um, tables from Wilson's work. Uh, I won't go over all of these. I just wanted to give you a, a feel for just like the, the job loss. So in a city like New York, which was a lot like Chicago, a heavy industrial base with a lot of immigration occurring in the early part of the century, if you compare 70 to 1984 in terms of the jobs that required less than a high school education, there was a 492,000, um, sorry, thousands, 492,000 uh, loss um, in, in that 15 year span, and, and it's seen over and over again. So, that was the deindustrialization part of his argument massive job loss, massive industrial job loss, which affected the um, people with an, uh, less than high school education or um, just some minimal. Uh, education. So then the next slide um, gives some figures to support the, the implications in terms of labor force participation or chronic unemployment. And <clears throat> I'm, again, not going to go through all of these, but just the story here, and it breaks it down into different age groups comparing 1960 into 1984, the lower part of the panel being among white Americans and the upper part of the panel black and other races. And the bottom line is if you look across these lines for white, the labor force participation rates are very stable across that time period. But if you look at the upper part of the table where it's looking at black and other races, across all of the age groups, there's significant declines from 1960 to 1984 in terms of labor force participation among all of those groups. So again, playing into to Wilson's point that um, African Americans in the inner city were hit hardest by this era, the decline of the city, this deindustrialization had particularly dramatic effects on um, inner city communities um, that were increasingly African American. This slide gives the female headed families the percentage of female headed households. Again, for white Americans, black Americans, we'll just focus on that comparison. From 1940 to 1983, you see very little movement among white families in terms of the percentage female headed. If you look at black, 1940, 17.9, jumps all the way to 41.9 by 1983. So it's a huge increase there. And again, the, the racial pattern is quite stark. 
Then the implications for that concentration of poverty. These are two maps from Wilson's work that depict the percent in poverty, and these are Chicago neighborhoods again. And in 1970, um, just to the, the, like, the darkest shaded neighborhoods have, the very, very dark shaded neighborhoods have 40% or more families living in, in poverty. Um, the kind of medium shaded are 30 to 40% living in poverty, and the more light shaded <clears throat> are 20 to 30%. Um, so there's only one like really super you know, high poverty neighborhood in 1970. By 1980, not only are there more dark shaded, he actually had to create another category. There's now four shadings, one of them being over 50% of families in the community living in poverty, then 40 to 50%. But the, the story here is you know, clearly that poverty got more concentrated. In the poor inner city neighborhoods, they got poorer in that it was, like I said, more concentrated with a higher percentage of families there living below the poverty level. And, So that's the, so far I've covered sort of the racial inequality and the structural aspects of this notion of truly disadvantaged. Wilson also talked about the implications of these um, two previous conditions for, for culture, and he suggested that culture wasn't different in the inner city. It was mainstream conventional culture that residents abided by, but that mainstream culture was severely weakened um, during this era. <clears throat> so concentrated disadvantage and social isolation really altered the cultural landscape, and he's, he talks about how these conditions fostered what he termed ghetto behaviors, which he just used to refer to unconventional behavior like idleness, overt sexuality, teenage childbearing, and drug dealing. Um, and he was very clear that, again, these behaviors were not valued among the residents, but they were tolerated. They were increasingly tolerated as the poverty got more concentrated and as the d disadvantage got more severe. We refer to that as attenuated culture. M why would they tolerate such behaviors if they didn't value them? Um, well, Wilson suggests, first of all, there were very few conceivable valued options. They didn't have the, the like I said, the jobs that they went uh, to the inner city in search of were gone um, very shortly after arriving. So there were few conceivable valued options. And then that exodus of the middle class really comes into play with those few social buffers. There were simply few role models of you know, people getting up and going to work every day for jobs, people sort of delaying childbearing until they were in a financially secure situation. And without those sort of models or way of doing things, these sorts of behaviors, he said, were sort of transmitted by precept in the inner city, just magnifying um, the problems. <clears throat> So in conjunction or in collaboration with Robert Sampson, um, William Julius Wilson has sort of combined a lot of his ideas about the truly disadvantaged into um, somewhat of a theory of neighborhood crime. So why is truly disadvantaged related to, or how, how does it create high crime neighborhoods? Um, truly disadvantaged neighborhoods, first of all, have these massive structural deficits um, that I talked about, brought on by outmigration, deindustrialization, and segregation. Truly disadvantaged neighborhoods also have weakened cult culture. They less than fervently condemn unconventional behaviors. They don't have the social buffers to do so in a strong way. True disadvantage affects crime equally across neighborhoods of different racial compositions, but importantly, Truly disadvantaged neighborhoods are much more likely to be predominantly black as opposed to predominantly white. So Wilson and Sampson say the same mechanism applies equally across races, and they refer to this as the racial invariance thesis. But importantly, because of that racial inequality component, this was an experience, an image, that African Americans were simply much more likely to experience than white Americans. <clears throat> So in terms of implications for crime reduction, I think this was a lot, um, this perspective was much more pessimistic than Sean McKay's original social disorganization image, which, which had this implicit assumption that people would make it out of this condition. 
And um, Wilson's idea of the truly disadvantaged, on the other hand, um, you know, seems more pessimistic. I mean, even the notion, like, it's not just disadvantaged, it's truly disadvantaged. <laughs> I mean, it just sounds pretty bleak, right? Um, and, and I think that that, that is correct. Um, there was not this assumption that progression out of the inner city was naturally occurring and inevitable. Um, but, you know, he did advocate for broad macro level policies that might help, um, but they really are big picture policies that aren't easily enacted. Um, job growth, economic policy, and in particular, the sorts of jobs that would replace the lost industrial jobs and provide a living wage. And I don't think our economy is yet to figure out um, how to do that effectively. So <clears throat> in some ways, we still have the truly disadvantaged um, in many segments of the United States. <clears throat> All right, the third image I want to talk about, you know, that provides this answer to the question, what distinguishes high crime communities from low crime communities? So, so far I've talked about social disorganization as one answer, coming in an era of growth. Two, um, the truly disadvantaged as another answer, coming from an era of, of tremendous urban decline. The third image is community as collective efficacy. And this image was popular, or began to be popular, around 2000 to the present. And thus, it emerged in an era that we refer to as the resurgence of the city. <clears throat> Rob Sampson, who's pictured here, and his colleagues um, have been very influential in this perspective, starting in the late 1990s and up to the current day, largely um, coming from their work analyzing the, the project on human development and Chicago neighborhood data. <clears throat> the bottom line in this image is that safe communities can be achieved through collective efficacy. So that's the organizing construct in this particular image. And this is framed in terms of low crime communities. So instead of answering the question, you know, what do high crime communities have? What, what do high crime communities look like? They're socially disorganized or they're truly disadvantaged. They kind of come about it from the other way. What do safe or low crime communities have? They have collective efficacy. It's a view that turns away from emphasizing the lack of strong and lasting connections among neighborhood residents, such as the social disorganization perspective. It also turns away from focusing on the despair brought on by industrialization, the truly disadvantaged, and instead it emphasizes human agency and purposive action. So it's really a, a very different image in that regard. Now, to explain the socio-historical context of cities from which this sort of image emerged, I was going to literally show you a commercial. I thought it would be a good time for a commercial break. <laughs> so I am actually going to show you a commercial. It's a commercial that was aired during halftime of the 2011 Super Bowl. And it sort of hits on this, this new um, historical context of the resurgence of the city. I got a question for you. What does this city know about luxury? Huh? What does a town that's been to hell and back know about the finer things in life? Well, I'll tell you, more than most. You see, it's the hottest fires that make the hardest steel. Add hard work and conviction and the know-how that runs generations deep in every last one of us. That's who we are. That's our story. Now, it's probably not the one you've been reading in papers, the one being written by folks who've never even been here and don't know what we're capable of. Because when it comes to luxury, it's as much about where it's from as who it's for. Now, we're from America, but this isn't New York City, or the Windy City, or Sin City, and we're certainly no one's Emerald City. city. 
this is what we do. So I think the commercial, I just think it hits on exactly the, the point we're trying to convey in this era, the resurgence of this city. Um, we see this new era as being one that's characterized by once manufacturing dominant cities experiencing some resurgence, uh, resurgence in the wake of the devastation that those same cities felt in the previous era, the decline of the city, when we had that massive deindustrialization and you had empty factories, warehouses everywhere. And key industries, including the American uh, motor industries, are rebounding. Um, new industries are emerging, tech, innovation, globalization is helping in that regard. New headquarters are moving in. <clears throat> Empty spaces are being um, converted to lofts, bars, craft breweries, coffee houses in some of these cities that were in decline 20, 30 years ago. <clears throat> Young professionals and empty nesters are moving back to many cities like we hadn't seen um, in a, a long while. <clears throat> so this is the sort of context that we see in this new era in urban areas in the United States. And it seems like, therefore, it's, a, it's an era that's ripe for kind of a new image um, of, of what is behind community variation in crime. Decline and disorder, again, that characterized the previous era are no longer, are no longer seem to be an inevitable fate from which there is no escape. And instead, it does seem to be as if human agency matters again. We can rise up. We can solve problems, even in the hardest hit of communities like Detroit. Right? <laughs> and I think this notion, this image of collective efficacy at, in low crime communities really plays well with that socio-historical context of rising up and, and agency and what have you. Um, <clears throat> Samson says this, this, F, this concept consists of two parts. One is social cohesion and trust among neighbors. But social cohesion that doesn't rely upon really close personal connections, just a working trust. You can work with one another. You feel as if, OK, we're on the same page. And then secondly, these shared expectations for action you know, if pressed to do so. So if a community problem arises, do I feel like, you know, my neighbors um, are going to work with me and we're going to solve this problem together? We don't have to have dinner together. We don't have to be friends. But do I feel as if we can come together collectively and establish or, or solve problems as necessary? I think it's a really appropriate image to have of safe communities in this unique historical era where we are where we're often electronically connected to people in a personal way halfway around the globe, you know, maybe, maybe more so than we are our, our neighbors, you know, the people who live right next door. Um, so this old notion of effective neighborhoods having these really close personal connections, I think, is outdated. But do they have working trust, and will they mobilize and, and um, exhibit human agency if called upon <clears throat> that resilience? So this notion, collective efficacy leading to lower rates of crime. And Samson and his colleagues certainly recognize that disadvantage, it's not like they leave disadvantage that Wilson talked so much about in the era of decline behind. I mean, they recognize this still plays an important role. Disadvantage will definitely weaken efficacy. But in our view, the outlook of disadvantaged communities still seems more hopeful you know, in, in, with this image of the community and in this era than it did in the era of, of urban decline. The key in establishing this efficacy, even in the face of disadvantage, is in developing this, like I said before, working trust and shared expectations for action if needed. It really draws upon collective spirit, in relation to specific tasks. <clears throat> 
so people don't have to have long-standing ties in their community or even be there particularly long. They just have to care about the well-being of it, and if you give them a particular task, be engaged in that. And I think it fits very well with the millennial outlook as well. Um, you know, it's just, I guess, anecdotal, but you know, there is a, a lot of talk, at least in our department, that you know, millennials really want to be engaged and, and they don't care as much about money and, and making you know, a, a big salary, but they want to make a difference in the world and in their world and in their community. And I think the collective efficacy image of low crime communities fits well with that. <clears throat> So rather than uh, relying on these long-standing close connections among neighbors, like I said, it just relies upon action-oriented communication. So things like listservs and web pages that, of course, were not part of the crime and crime prevention 50 or 100 years ago can become you know, part of solutions and, and getting neighbors together to solve problems. Um, and I've got a bit of an excerpt. It's, um, about, it has nothing to do with crime, it has to do with saving a cat. So, but it sort of displays how neighborhood listservs can be used to effectively solve community issues that arise among people who may not even know one another personally or individually, but they're e-connected to one another and they're dealing with problems in, in this way. So this comes from a listserv in a neighborhood in the greater Cincinnati area, so it's for real. I've, ta I've changed the names so as to you know, protect anonymity, but so Angela writes, you know, this morning I, I became aware of a cat stuck up in a, a very high in a large tree in front of my house on Maple Avenue. The cat's maybe 30 feet up. It's mostly white and gray tail. It looks malnourished. I can see that it does have a collar on, though. My neighbor says it's been there for several days. Another neighbor put a few ladder, ladders together to climb down, but no luck. I put some food at the bottom as well. I also called the fire department to ask for their help. However, they said it was too dangerous for them to help in a situation like this. So, is anyone missing a cat? Does anyone have any ideas on getting the cat down? Email me directly, as I'm not likely to be checking back here often. Thanks, Angela. About an hour later, a reply from a neighbor, Aaron, also on Maple, comes in. This is a very sad situation. With the heat, this cat is not going to last much longer. The nice guys from the painting company tried to get her out, but the cat is afraid. It would be nice if we could get some help from the city or fire department. Time is of the essence, and this is sad to watch. We are at the end of the street. If anyone can help, the cat is 30 feet up. A couple hours later, has anyone checked with animal control or SPCA? They might be able to help. And another neighbor chimes in. How high up is the critter? And is it mean? Has it <laughs> has rabies shot? I have a 40-foot ladder if someone would hold it. It's not too close to the power lines. Um, you, could, uh, you could call Decade. I hear they have a bucket truck and would love the publicity. Uh, does anyone know why the cats do that? Where are the animal psychics when we need them? I'm good with dogs and frogs, but not good with cats. I'm allergic. <laughs> Then a few minutes later, another one, or a couple hours later, does anyone have an update on the poor cat? And finally, later that evening or the next morning, a, a, a district judge, who is actually part of the neighborhood listserv, replied, the cat in the tree on Maple was rescued in quite a dramatic fashion this evening by the fire department. Afterward, a very kind Aaron took him to a vet for assessment. The vet gave all the care for free. He's been given an IV and some food to help him recover. Turns out he's friendly. The little guy just needed some luck and basic care. He goes on to describe the cat. And then at the bottom, he's like, we obviously would love to find a home. Aaron will keep him for a day or two, but neither of us can take him in permanently. If anyone knows who he may belong to, there's room for a new kitty with a wonderfully dramatic story. <laughs> Please let me know. So um, anyway, I just think it, it illustrates the whole notion of collective empathy. Again, nothing to do with a crime-related issue, but an important, well, that everyone seemed to be on the same page, that like, this is you know, really terrible about this cat. What can we do <laughs> in channeling the resources without knowing one another personally? You know, some of them may have, but it appears as if you know, there's no personal connection there. But they're all invested in agency you know, and finding a way uh, to solve this problem. And they did. They did. <clears throat> okay, um, so those are the three images from the book that are sort of existing images that we've seen, one from each of the three historical eras that we've seen over the past century. Um, I just want to spend a little bit of time giving you a flavor for the 
um, four images that we see potentially informing future ideas about high crime versus low crime communities. And I don't have nearly as much to say about these because they're not entrenched images. <laughs> this is speculative, so this should go pretty quickly. But we have four potential future images of community that we identify in the book. One, um, community as multi-contextual. Two, community as over-criminalized. Three, community as a racial divide. And four, community beyond the urban core. <clears throat> so first, community as, as multi-contextual. Well, throughout this talk, um, you may have noticed I never gave an actual definition of what is community, and it's actually been one of the sticking points in community criminology um, from the beginning. And um, typically, you know, scholars studying communities, it's like it's one of those things, you know it when you see it, you know, <laughs> but they, it's hard to come up with exact definitions. Typically, people have relied on what I call a meso-level conceptualization of community, so smaller than a city, but larger than a place or a street block or something like that. So it's a distinct unit of a city um, that has a distinctive social um, character to it. And um, most criminologists throughout the, the history, really, of community criminology um, have used units of analysis like census tracts or block groups to approximate this um, neighborhood. Well, those are certainly imperfect because, you know, how many people believe that residents really, you know, think that their neighborhood ends at the census tract boundary? You know, it's probably unrealistic to think that it's that good of a definition, but it's a pretty close approximation of these um, meso-level, within-city, socially distinctive groups. However, that, that kind of meso-level conceptualization of community is starting to get criticized on two different, very different fronts. And one is what I call the crime and place challenge, and the other is the macro context challenge. And the crime and place challenge simply refers to the fact that you know, all of this crime and place research that has really come upon the scene the last 30 years in criminology suggests that there is just now too much evidence of within neighborhood hotspots of crime, that neighborhoods are themselves heterogeneous and that crime is not pervasive across a neighborhood but is rather concentrated at a few, on a few streets or street blocks or places, addresses within communities, so hot spots. Um, and that community is too large a unit, therefore, to focus on understanding high versus low crime geographic areas that we need to um, focus um, more closely on microspatial units like places or streets and to really understand high versus low crime distinctions. So <clears throat> that's one argument that community scholars have had to deal with. And at the other end of the spectrum is the argument that actually community influences extends beyond neighborhood boundaries, that um, there are forces sort of outside neighborhoods that affect what happens in neighborhoods. So, just as an example of this, um, some of the work done by collective efficacy, efficacy scholars has shown that not only is a neighborhood's collective efficacy related to their levels of crime, but their neighboring neighborhood's level of collective efficacy is related to that focal neighborhood's rate of crime. So it's the spatial adjacency and proximity that matters as well. It's not like these uh, neighborhoods you know, influence ends at the neighborhood boundary. Neighbor, neighboring neighborhoods matter as well. So that's influence from a, on a more micro or macro spatial scale, excuse me. <clears throat> so, you know, on the one hand, we've got people saying, no, the influence, kind of community influence should be a lot smaller than a neighborhood. And on the other hand, we've got evidence suggesting that influences on communities come from beyond, you know, on a, on a broader macro level scale. So that's what we're referring to with maybe this movement towards a multi-contextual community or multi-contextual conceptualization of community where community is defined in a lot of different ways using multiple units of analysis and not a single unit of analysis to understand you know, why we see um, the spatial patterning of crime that, that we see. <clears throat> Secondly, um, one potential future image we see is the community is over-criminalized. Um, 
you know, we raise this question, is there a falsehood in even thinking of neighborhoods as delinquency areas that Sean McKay called them, you know, over 100 years ago? Um, <clears throat> And we think that this may be sort of a, a, the wrong approach to think about neighborhoods for a couple of reasons. One, it assumes homogeneity um, in the neighborhood. And two, it assumes intractability. And we think both of those assumptions are just incorrect. One, the homogeneity. The fact of the matter is, even in Sean McKay's data, the highest rates of crime they saw were around 1920 um, delinquents per 100 youths, okay? That still means, that's the highest areas. Now, they ranged all the way down to two or three, okay? So you had tremendous variation. You certainly had high delinquency communities and low delinquency communities. But even in the highest delinquency communities, one in five kids was non-delinquent, you know, not delinquent. And I think we lose sight of that in community criminology, focusing so much on high crime versus low crime. The fact of the matter is, even in high crime, the norm by far is non-crime or non-delinquency. And so, so do we need to change that discussion a bit? <clears throat> um, in terms of the assumption of community intractability, um, you know, this notion that communities are high crime and we kind of over-criminalize them um, thinking that you know, they can never change. And the fact of the matter is you just look at you know, crime rates in the United States, they clearly, you know, we've been experiencing this great crime, great crime decline until the latest few years where it's starting to pick back up a bit, but you know, massive declines in crime. Um, so I think we're in an era also where we have to question you know, how we talk about community influence and crime in communities to begin with. One, it's not maybe as pervasive as um, some perspectives make it sound like it is, and two, it is not intractable. <clears throat> Third, another emerging image we see, we refer to as community as the racial divide, as a racial divide. Um, in all of the community criminology perspectives, race has kind of been at the background. Some of the perspectives have dealt with race, like Wilson's perspective, who clearly integrated racial inequality into his notion of the truly disadvantaged. But it wasn't about race. You know, it, it dealt with race, but it wasn't about race. And in fact, he assumed the racial, racial invariance in his truly disadvantaged perspective. Well, he saw racial inequality as playing a role. He assumed that that same process would affect black neighborhoods equally as white neighborhoods. <clears throat> But I think we may be at a place where we need to question that in a new direction toward a black criminology um, that Unover and Gabadon have talked about. We're much more explicitly addressing how race and racism affect crime and justice and affect community influences. The evidence of what's been referred to as the Latino paradox also comes into play here. We now have evidence that very disadvantaged um, neighborhoods that are predominantly Latinx don't suffer the same crime problems as white and black neighborhoods that have similar levels of disadvantage, and that's referred to as the Latino paradox. Um, but the notion is that there may need to be you know, unique um, explanations for either black neighborhoods or Latino neighborhoods rather than having this sort of racial invariance assumption in community criminology. Um, so that's, that's another direction we think where we're headed. And then finally, community beyond the urban core. You know, throughout the course of my talk, I've largely been talking about perspectives that were looking into inner city communities with the assumption that that's where the high crime communities were, going all the way back to Sean McKay's. You know, and that was all based on this notion that cities grew in a concentric fashion from the center out. But again, that's changing. We clearly have different models of urban growth. It's been referred to the LA model where it's not growing in a concentric fashion. You know, so how well can our images of community adapt to that and account for patterns of crime that, you know, where you have high crime communities way out from the, the inner city? <clears throat> Gentrification is also kind of fueling that debate as you know, I talked about in the era, the era um, resurgence in, in, the, in urban areas. Um, people are moving back to the inner cities, so <clears throat> the young professionals and empty nesters are coming back. That's changing the dynamic in inner cities. That might have implications for where high versus low crime era, 
areas, excuse me, are, we don't know yet, it's too early, but people have speculated that we might be entering um, a period where we see inversion of the pattern where crime was highest in the inner city and it may be, you know, 20 years from now it's higher, or 30 years from now it's higher in suburban areas. Um, where inner city populations are pushed out to those areas because of the gentrification. And I'm not saying that's the case, it's too early. I don't think we have solid evidence of that yet, but that is something that we may need to deal with. <clears throat> also, we have you know, other severely hit communities that are not urban at all. And we refer to these as the forgotten flyover communities who are interestingly now experiencing some of the ravages of deindustrialization that the inner city communities were in the era of, of urban decline. Um, and so, are, you know, will community criminology adapt to that? For the most part, community criminology has not addressed non-urban communities. It's been purely, had purely an urban focus and the time may be ripe for that to change. And I think especially if you see some of the, um, the devastation in some of our non-urban communities today. <clears throat> and then finally, um, it's speaking internationally, I mean, I've been talking a lot, if you keep using the phrase American criminology, was talking about the work of communities within, um, with a focus on United States communities. And in the last decade or so, we've certainly seen a lot of international scholars try to apply some of these models that were developed by looking into U.S. communities, but to communities <clears throat> in Australia, in China, in the Netherlands, just to name a few examples, with some degrees of support, but you know, I, I'm not sure that that's the best strategy. You know, why would we necessarily think that explanations for community, high crime versus low crime communities that emerged by looking into U.S. urban areas would not be ill-fitting you know, when, when we try to apply them to cities, like I said, in China, the Netherlands, or Australia. Um, so it may be time to start developing you know, theories or explanations of crime that are based on images of community in cities around the globe rather than focusing solely on uh, U.S. communities. <clears throat> Thank you, Pamela, for a very, very interesting presentation. Um, so two questions. Uh, so in complex social phenomenon, there's always a, I mean, there's a danger always in hanging your hat on just one variable. Mm -hmm. But how much is age a factor in this? So if you look at the, uh, the first era that you discussed, right, you've got immigrant communities, most of them are younger, coming in in that transition zone. Then they get older, they move out, they don't take their crime with them, but maybe it's because they got older. Uh, similarly, in the um, second era, you've got uh, larger families, maybe one uh, one household, one one parent families, but uh, uh, but you've got uh, larger families, and then the birth rate declines there, and so you may see over time, you know, moving the third stage of decline in crime in those areas as well. So, how much of it is just the the issue that young people tend to, you know, cause more crime than older people do? That's the first question. The second question is. Um, the idea of those new immigrant communities in the transition zones coming in, um, there's a certain stereotype that they had really strong social bonds, um, you know, the kind of idea that if one of the kids may misbehaved in the neighborhood, any of the, you know, neighbors could take care of the kid and, you know, slap them on the backside, that kind of thing they used to do in those days. Um, and that when they actually moved out to the suburbs, they lost those social bonds. Is that just a stereotype, or was that, you know, actually what was going on in those communities? In which era? Were you talking about a particular Yeah, the first, to the first era, when oh. they just came in and they lived in those uh, transition uh, housing type of situations. Okay. Yeah, well, so first the age issue. Um, yeah, but the aggregate level, at the community level, um, and I'm not saying that means it doesn't have an effect, because it could just be that we've controlled for too many variables, and so we're actually masking the effect that's really important, which is the age structure. Um, but age structure, by and large, has very inconsistent effects in macro level models of crime, and, and I will include community, even though I think it's a meso level unit of analysis, but you know, beyond individual level. It just, we don't see much consistency there. So that's one thing. Now that's different than an individual level aging out you know, phenomenon that you're describing. Um, 
Now, having said that, age structure was definitely a part of, um, well, I think, why there were high rates of delinquency in the socially disorganized era, areas in the era of urban growth. Um, and for the truly disadvantaged. I mean, I didn't have it up there, but Wilson talked about demographic patterns, including age structure, a very young population being part of that, what he describes as this perfect storm of, you know, a young population, then the deindustrialization, um, you know, and the, the implications for family formation and the exodus of middle class. So that was part of the explanation there. Um, that, yeah, I, I didn't mention that, but. I don't, I don't know if I'm addressing your question there, but from a variable standpoint, like if you put you know, economic disadvantage and age structure of the population and residential instability, for instance, in a model and predicted community rates of crime, and we've just seen over the past 30, 40 years a lot of inconsistency of a lot of null effects of the age structure variable. Now, I guess that I don't want to say that means it's not important because you know, it's probably correlated with some of these other factors and disentangling that stuff can be difficult. Um, the second question, remind me, it was the, 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 do they, the residents become less attached as they move past through? I, I think, well, in the era of urban growth, the qu answer to that question would be just the opposite. They reach a point where in conditions of you know, low poverty, more stability, and more homogeneity, that there's more of a capability of exercising that informal social control to which you speak, um, that that wasn't as possible in those zones in transition because of the, the high poverty, the high ethnic heterogeneity, and the residential mobility. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, <laughs> is it a stereotype? Maybe. Yeah, I guess I'm getting back to your question because it... Any, any other questions? Okay, thinking about the question, I will ask a question <laughs> in, in between. Okay, uh, Dr. W uh, Wilcox, uh, I have a question. When you talk about collective efficacy, you know, uh, you, the example you gave is about the community, which, you know, uh, saving the cat. <laughs> right. Papansky uh, from University of Indiana at Blooming, uh, Bloomington, in the 70s, he wrote an article, he said that, you know, anything, you talk about community collective efficacy, it should be community initiated. Mm -hmm. Activities such as concerts, you know, barbecue, mm -hmm. not led by the police. Police won't do a good job. Mm -hmm. You fool around with the police, increase your fear. Yeah. So oh, in, you know, about five years ago, I wrote an article, I look at volunteers mm -hmm. with the police and with known uh, volunteers, residents, I look at that fear. And I found that the closer you work with the police, the more fear you have, Volu uh, uh, violent crime particularly. Uh, property crime average, because you know, when the police come, they spread fear. The argument here is, you know, you know what happened in your neighborhood, oh, two murders. Otherwise, I won't be able to know it. Now, wow, God, how can that happen? You know, you look at your out your windows. You know, you things like that. Broken window on the other side, emphasize on the in, interference of the police. Police is the backbone of the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Collective advocacy is based on the uh, uh, on the police efforts. What's your take on that? Um, yeah, I think it would depend on the era. No surprise, I would say that. Right? Um, at the in the era of urban growth, I think the grassroots community involvement was key, and that's you know the whole basis of the Chicago area project. And Shaw, Clifford Shaw, would definitely agree that it had to come from the community, and you know, and I think that's what the Chicago area project tried to accomplish. Um, so within the community, I think yeah, definitely from the outset of community criminology has been the preference. I do think that has changed. Um, one, well, the, I'll just stick to the three images that I talked about today because you have the sort of the backstory to them. I mean, with the truly disadvantaged, you know, Wilson was wanting, I mean, he needed, he said these inner city communities need help from the outside and it needs to be, I mean, it was broad macroeconomic help, okay, so not the police, but shifts in economic 
um, well, jobs and the economic structure. Um, so, but then as we move into the resurgence, I'm of two minds. One, I still think, you know, and, and collective efficacy really is a direct descendant of the Chicago School, those initial social disorganization. So I think there's still that element of from within the community is best. But I do think that because ties and relationships among neighbor, neighbors is so different today than it was then, there is this also this recognition that um, different types of ties, including ties outside of residents outside the community, is necessary for the most effective informal social control of crime. So, for instance, I'm thinking of um, like the, the term new parochialism is used in a branch of community criminology to talk about um, ties among neighbors in conjunction with efforts from police and sort of partnerships. I mean, police community partnerships is probably the easiest way to describe it. They talk about in community criminology in terms of the term new parochialism. Um, but it, it's this idea that, you know, the, the notion that communities are so tied, so closely tied together that they can effectively solve problems without any external resources or any external help might be outdated because we just don't live in that sort of world anymore. Um, and so that's what has led to this new parochialism. And it doesn't have to be police. It can be other um, agencies outside the community that are sort of helping residents solve community problems. Um, to date, I think collective efficacy theory, though, and new parochialism have kind of been two branches of current day community criminology, and I've yet to see them coming together. So for instance, I haven't seen work on collective efficacy that also talks about those linkages, you know, that's been done in this new parochialism literature, to my knowledge, and um, not, I may be wrong or missing something, but yeah. But yeah, you're absolutely right. That's not going to work in, um, you know, in fact, this notion of new, par new parochialism is, is relatively new and so far has only been shown through qualitative research to be really effective in sort of middle working class neighborhoods. And I'm not so sure this notion of police community partnerships is going to be as effective in, you know, disadvantaged, um, very high crime neighborhoods because of the fear, you know, that you describe and the police legitimacy issues that are often confronting those neighborhoods as well. And so I think the verdict is still out on this community model known as new parochialism where, you know, is it possible for a few neighbors who are closely tied together to partner with police or external agencies to effectively solve problems? It hasn't been shown in the hardest hit neighborhoods yet to be effective, but it's still new. So I, I didn't really answer your Thanks. question, but that's what I can speak to it. Any questions? Yeah. Okay, well, one observation, uh, you said is totally right. I have a friend, he's a, a PhD in statistics and he worked for the first data in the United States. And he said that when you add a risk score, when you apply for a credit card, census track data, where he lives will be good enough, or zip code. Mm -hmm. Then he moved to Hong Kong, also do the risk assessment. He said that in Asian countries, you really need the address. Mm -hmm. Census track data won't work. Like in Shanghai, the, this house is, you know, $3 million. That house, $30,000. They live together. Crime is low, very different. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for Doc Wilcox's presentation. <laughs>